Hi, and welcome to the third and final video in our Tropical Cycle and Climatology series. This one's much, much less dense than the previous one that focused on the necessary conditions for tropical cyclone formation. In this one, we take a look at what are known as tropical cyclone genesis, or formation pathways, describing basic characteristics of the environments and the nature of the disturbances that give rise to tropical cyclones. So keep in mind that these do not supersede the necessary conditions that we talked about in the previous uh, recording the previous video. We need all of those conditions to be present. But in this fashion here, through these genesis pathways, we look at similarities between characteristics of the environments in which those necessary conditions need to be met in order for a tropical cyclone to ultimately form. So we define these genesis pathways on a two-dimensional phase space, where we have the x-axis here referencing the quasi-geostrophic forcing for ascent magnitude. That's very jargony, and especially those of you who have not gotten into synoptic and dynamic meteorology may not know exactly what I mean by that. What I mean here is forcing from mid-latitude features or mid-latitude-like features. When you have a trough of low pressure that forces air to rise out ahead of it, or when you have a frontal boundary over which air ascends, that's what I mean by these quasi-geostrophic forcings for ascent. On the y-axis here, we have a metric that's related to the magnitude of the large-scale horizontal temperature gradient. We know that in the tropics, the temperature change is small, the temperature gradient is weak. But in the mid-latitudes, especially when you're dealing with fronts, you have much larger gradients of temperature. Uh, temperature changes in a horizontal direction. You can, in some cases, see large gradients within the tropics in the form of, for instance, land to uh, sea contrasts, like with the Sahara Desert to the cold waters of the Atlantic Ocean. You can get a very large horizontal temperature gradient that way. But otherwise, in general, the tropics are associated with smaller horizontal temperature gradients. Within this two-dimensional phase space, we can define six categories, one of which was removed in a later update to this here, so we'll focus primarily on the other five. Here on the left side of the x-axis, where you have weak mid-latitude type forcing for rising motion, so in other words, any rising motion that you have is going to be isolated to a given disturbance, like with air converging in at low levels that we know through continuity must then ascend. We have this non-baroclinic and then low-level baroclinic here, where baroclinic is just a term that represents the magnitude of the horizontal temperature gradient. If it's non-baroclinic, that temperature gradient is small to non-existent. If it's low-level baroclinic, what we're referring to is a larger horizontal temperature gradient at low levels near the surface. And so it makes sense that non-baroclinic is lower on the y-axis here than is low-level baroclinic. And we'll keep in mind that this low-level baroclinic is primarily found near to land in association with those land-sea temperature contrasts. So these two are our primarily tropical modes of tropical cyclone formation. But then as we move to the far end of the x-axis, as you get to larger mid-latitude-like forcing for rising motion, we get three additional categories here, distinguished by the magnitude of their low-level temperature gradients. We have weak low-level temperature gradients here for trough-induced. This is when you get a cutoff area of low pressure in the middle to upper troposphere over warm ocean waters in the subtropics. And over some period of time, convection helps to change the structure of that feature into something more like a tropical cyclone. But it's a non-frontal cyclone to begin with that becomes a tropical cyclone over time. Whereas as you increase the magnitude of that low-level temperature gradient, you get to this weak and strong TT, or tropical transition. This is something that starts as a non-tropical or frontal cyclone with weak to large horizontal temperature gradients. So varying degrees of how strong those fronts are at the initial uh, point in this formation process. And over some period of time, those cyclones become cut off, 
from the mid-latitude flow over relatively warm tropical to subtropical waters. And over time, surface heating and thunderstorm activity help to transform that structure from that frontal mid-latitude-like cyclone to a non-frontal tropical-like cyclone. So these three here on the right are primarily our mid-latitude influenced ways of getting a tropical cyclone. And the two here on the left are our tropical ways of getting a tropical cyclone. They all rely on convective activity in the presence of strong surface enthalpy fluxes, heat and moisture transport from the ocean to the air above, but they differ in terms of how you get that initial precursor disturbance. And to some extent in this idea of forcing for ascent, how you get convection to be supported, how much of it is conditional instability versus how much of it is forcible lifting from uh, some feature like a trough, for instance. So in terms of a pathway climatology, how do tropical cyclones ultimately form within each basin? So we have the six major basins of the world, North Pacific, West Pacific, or North Atlantic, West Pacific, South Pacific, South and North Indian, and East Pacific basins. On the x-axis here, we have the percentage of total developments within that basin, zero up to 80%. And for all but the North Atlantic here in purple, you have 60 to 80 or more percent of tropical cyclone developments along this non-baroclinic pathway, that purely tropical from the ITCZ, from the monsoon trough mode of development. In the North Atlantic, it's only about 40% from African easterly waves predominantly. Low-level baroclinic is roughly 5 to 15 percent, as are much of the other categories, closer to 5 percent in all basins apart from the North Atlantic in most cases, but then in the North Atlantic, the strong tropical transition and weak tropical transition range from 15 to 25 percent, associated with mid-latitude areas of low pressure that cut off from the mid-latitude westerly flow and transform into tropical cyclones over a prolonged period of time if all of the previously stated necessary conditions are met. You'll note that the North Indian Ocean also has a relatively high bar for weak tropical transition at about 20%. This is associated with the monsoon circulation. Those very few cyclones that form during the peak of the monsoon are associated with a transformation of an initially non-tropical-like circulation into a tropical cyclone very near to the coast of India on the periphery of the monsoon circulation. So in terms of where the different developments occur, we have all developments depicted by the dots here in the upper left panel, and then non-baroclinic upper right, low-level baroclinic middle left, trough-induced middle right, weak and strong tropical transitions on the bottom. Note that the non-baroclinic and the all-TC developments overlap pretty closely to each other as you might expect. But if we focus on the Atlantic here, note that there's practically none, apart from this one right here, north of 30 north, whereas you see quite a few dots, especially these colored ones here in the all-TC development category. We see the trough-induced, and especially the weak and the strong tropical transition cases at higher latitudes, where you get the mid-latitude features extending down, especially on the shoulders of the season, as we'll talk about more in a few moments here, uh, over the relatively warm waters of the western tropical and subtropical Atlantic basin, and over some period of time transform into tropical cyclones. The low-level baroclinic cases are almost all near land, contrast between the Australian deserts and the uh, tropical waters south of the maritime continent, the Mexican deserts and plateau relative to the eastern North Pacific, the Saharan desert relative to the eastern North Atlantic basin. So again, these are all related to low-level uh, land sea temperature contrasts and not to fronts. That's why we classify them as a tropical mode of development. So that and non-baroclinic tend to be closer to the equator. Trough-induced and the TT uh, tropical transition categories tend to be at higher latitudes and the subtropics to even mid-latitudes. So we can then focus on the Atlantic Basin and we'll focus on panels A and B at top for our tropical cases and D through F for our non-tropical cases here as well. And these show the tracks. And the non-baroclinic and low-level baroclinic are the climatological move west-northwest, turn northward, and then turn eastward at higher latitudes. We see that for low-level baroclinic as well. 
Whereas trough-induced, weak, and strong tropical transition, the lines for each of these all start at higher latitudes, and they predominantly move northward and eastward. You don't have very long lines here directed from east to west at low latitudes. So though they become cut off from the mid-latitude westerlies in order for them to form through one of these three pathways, they are not able to stay cut off from those mid-latitude westerlies very long as the pattern shifts over the course of a five to seven day period. So in the first few days of that period, they cut off, transform their structure and become a tropical cyclone in some selected instances. And then they have a two to three day window over which they may be able to develop. And then they get caught up by the mid-latitude westerlies and ultimately move to higher latitudes over colder waters and dissipate or transform back into non-tropical cyclones. We can look at this not just in terms of their lines of their tracks, but a density, a shading to highlight the areas where you get the most uh, overlap of those lines. The non barra Clinic extend from the tropical Atlantic and northwestern Caribbean Sea toward the north and west. The low level, eh, <laughs> the low level barra Clinic extends off of the coast of Africa, where we saw most of those uh, storms originating, to the west northwest over land, or sorry, toward land, toward North America. Whereas the trough-induced, weak and strong tropical transition, their maxima are all close to North America. The Gulf of Mexico and near Florida for the trough-induced and weak tropical transition cases, out over the open waters of the North Atlantic for the strong tropical transition cases. In terms of the seasonality, for all tropical cyclones in the North Atlantic, the climatology that we looked at a couple of videos ago is mimicked here with the peak from August or July through October, the peak around September 10th here. We see that each of the different pathways has a similar overall structure with a peak toward the middle of the season, but it's more sharply peaked for the non baroclinic and low-level baroclinic cases, and it's more spread out for the trough-induced and especially the weak and the strong tropical transition development cases. So during the peak of the season, all of these modes of uh, forming a tropical cyclone act with the non baroclinic and the low-level baroclinic uh, formation pathways being most common. But as you get to the beginning and end of the season or the shoulders of the season, April, May, June, uh, November, December, you see a much greater dominance of the trough-related or the mid-latitude-related pathways for getting a tropical cyclone. Clone. Excuse me, because you do not have the African easterly waves that give rise to non baroclinic and low level baroclinic modes of development. You just don't have the heating over Africa present to force their initiation and sustenance over the course of their westward trek toward the Atlantic Ocean. In terms of the seasonality, we can split this up here. This black line that you see here is the same in all of the panels, and this shows the percentage of all tropical cyclones that form within that given month. So the peak is in September, August is a little bit higher than October, which is a little bit higher than July. We can break this down for each of the different pathways, non baroclinic and low-level baroclinic in the top left and top middle, trough-induced and weak and strong tropical transition in the bottom uh, rows here. So in general, we see that the gray bars for the non baroclinic and low-level baroclinic extend to higher percentages than for all tropical cyclones in August and September, which means that most of the storms that form in August and September are from these two pathways. Whereas for trough-induced, we see a big extension in August, although only 14 members in the composite, and for weak and strong tropical transition, note how they peak above the black lines early and late in the season for the weak and strong tropical transition respectively, and they are below the black lines in August, September, October for weak, and June through September for strong tropical transition. So these categories move off of the center of the season toward the edge of the season in a relative basis. You still have fewer storms overall at that time, at those times of year, but when you do get a storm, it's much more likely that it's going to be from one of those alternative pathways than it is from a non-baroclinic or a low-level baroclinic pathway.
Finally, we look at the difference in lifetime maximum intensity depending on the origin of these features. So for non-baric clinic in the upper left and low-level baric clinic here in the upper middle, note how this black line is just like we saw on the previous slide. It represents the lifetime maximum intensity frequency for all tropical cyclones. You're below that black line at a lot of these lower intensities, especially here uh, for the low-level Barra Clinic, and you're above it at these higher intensities, 80 to 100 knots or greater. So relative to all tropical cyclones, those that form through non barra Clinic and low-level Barra Clinic pathways have a greater likelihood of achieving very, very large intensities, very high intensities, major hurricane status, as compared to other forms. Whereas trough-induced, weak tropical transition, and strong tropical transition, note that there's practically nothing in the way of gray bars at the higher intensities for each of these three classifications. And the gray bars extend to higher percentages at low intensities for all of these here. So though you can have a storm with a lifetime maximum intensity of tropical storm strength or weak hurricane strength from any of the pathways, Trough-induced, weak tropical transition, and strong tropical transition storms are generally only those intensities, whereas non-baroclinic and low-level baroclinic can get to the even higher intensities as they spend a longer period of time over the very warm tropical waters of the Atlantic Basin in typically more favorable environments isolated from the mid-latitudes. So wrapping up here, in all basins but the North Atlantic, the intertropical convergence zone as well as the monsoon trough serve as the dominant predecessor disturbances to tropical cyclones. Most commonly, you're going to see these features originating in the tropics and then moving toward the west and toward the subtropics as you go forward in time. However, in the North Atlantic, mid-latitude features more commonly serve as these predecessor disturbances, whether that be through the uh, trough-induced or the weaker strong tropical transition composites that we described. However, there are very clear distinctions between those uh, composites as well as the low-level baroclinic and non-baroclinic cases. Though unfortunately it's getting a little bit cut off here, those mid-latitude related predecessor disturbances are typically found at higher latitudes owing to the fact that they get cut off from mid-latitude features which start out at high latitudes, so they don't extend all the way down toward the equator. And because they're typically found at higher latitudes, they last shorter periods of time before they get caught up again by the mid-latitude flow. And because they have less time to develop and are typically in less favorable environments closer to the mid-latitudes, they typically have lower lifetime maximum intensities. So this wraps up our discussion of tropical cyclone climatology. We've chewed off a lot here, looking at where storms form and what a storm actually is, and general attributes about how they move, uh, where they track, how fast uh, their wind speeds ultimately get, things of that nature, followed by a comprehensive discussion of the necessary conditions, the what and especially the why of those conditions for tropical cyclone formation, and now putting those into a context here of the precursor disturbances and envir related environmental attributes that then give rise to tropical cyclones. As we get to our next video series, we're going to take a bit closer look at tropical cyclone formation, dovetailing off of the why that we introduced in our previous video to describe a little bit more about just how you go from something like an African easterly wave or an ITCZ or monsoon trough disturbance to a tropical cyclone. But until then, thanks for tuning in.